balances everything in this ecosystem. And if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of building and observing mini Bita, it's this. Balance comes in many forms, from predators and prey interactions, to humidity and rainfall, to the constant cycling of nutrients. Balance is literally the difference between the entire system surviving or collapsing. But balance isn't really something we can arrive to and just maintain forever. It's always a moving target. Small changes here create big effects that amplify and touch every part of the system. Out in nature, balance and imbalance can span centuries or millennia, timescales that are just too far for us to really grasp and appreciate. But in Minibyta, for it being such a small ecosystem, these shifts will play out on our scale, our human size scale. We can see the results of change unfold within weeks or months and sometimes even days. Over the years, I've seen balance tilt and reset again and again. When I first introduced crayfish into a tank with bladder snails and ram's horn snails, everything seemed stable, with two snail species sharing space by filling different niches. But the crayfish changed everything. Bladder snails with their soft shells and few hiding places were wiped out completely. It wasn't until much later after plants had grown in thick and created new shells that I could reintroduce them and see them finally survive alongside their predators. In an old grassland biome, I learned how crucial rainfall is. One half of the land thrived while the other half sort of withered, not because of soil or light, but because condensation from the first atmosphere prototype dripped steadily only on one side. That precipitation alone made the difference between life flourishing or stalling out, even within just this one biome. Then there was a time a single broadleaf plant sprouted among a carpet of low ground covering plants. I thought it might grow too large for the system, but I let it continue. And within months, it reached the lights above and shaded every plant below, slowly driving the ground covering plant into extinction. And in the saltwater realm, imbalance came in the form of filamentous algae. It grew so explosively that it consumed all the oxygen, suffocating sponges, invertebrates, and nearly everything else, collapsing the entire system. It took months for recovery, and even then, I ultimately needed to rebuild this biome. Each of these moments showed me that balance isn't still or ever really reached. Balance holds tension, and it's in motion. Every part of it is pulling against the other, constantly adjusting and creating slight advantages or disadvantages. Even with seasons that can shift the entire balance of which organisms will be able to come out on top. But now Minibyta today feels different. The system is maturing. The dramatic swings of the past have slowed and what once changed in days or weeks now stretches across months. The balance isn't frozen, it's just steadier, more deliberate almost like the ecosystem itself is settling into longer rhythms. And with that, new challenges emerge. Patterns that feel locked in, places where the system resists change, and parts of the web that seem stalled or slow to grow are waiting for the right spark to move it forward again. And in the freshwater realm, most plants I introduced were quickly eaten by crayfish, so the realm was pretty barren for two years. So I searched for one that could grow fast enough to withstand the pressure, and that's when I added the creeping primrose willow. It worked well, but sort of too well at the same time. The willow spread aggressively, soaking up nutrients and building dense mats until I couldn't even see into the tank anymore. To push back, I then introduced water spangle, a floating plant that competes for light at the surface. The widow immediately shifted strategies and it dropped its shaded underwater leaves and grew upwards, breaking out of the water to chase light above the spangle. The spangle grows fast too, but unlike the willow, it's regularly grazed by crayfish its future here is really uncertain. Still though, the spangle brings something new. Its mats shelter water fleas, copepods, and other zooplankton, laying the foundation for a richer food web. If it can establish itself, either now or when the lake biome expands into new tanks, it could become a crucial piece of complexity in this realm. On the terrestrial side, thick grass dominates the landscape, but it's poorly used by the creatures here. Crickets and roaches survive, but they don't thrive with the rapid growth they might have in a richer environment. Their populations inch forward slowly, but they're held back by limited nutrition and predators waiting for them. The predators here are stable, but the food web below them is fragile. To truly push this realm forward, the system needs plants that provide richer, faster nutrients, the kind that could spark a boom in primary consumers, and from there, ripple upward into greater complexity. I've also tried adding grasshoppers to this realm many times, but they've always quickly died out. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out why. 
I thought the problem was airflow or humidity, so I tested it with fans and environmental adjustments, but the grasshopper still didn't make it. They even bred, but their offsprings never grew beyond a couple molts. It was only recently that I realized the real issue here, that grasshoppers need far more water than the grass itself can provide. In the wild, they rely on dew that forms on blades of grass each morning, and dew does form in mini biota, but only when the system isn't venting. For that, I'll need a fully working atmosphere across the tanks before I could really put this hypothesis to the test. But until then, grasshoppers remain just out of reach for the balance of this biome, but certainly something to look forward to. And in the saltwater realm, the water is clearer than ever. Filter feeders like clams, oysters, and slipper snails keep it clean, while seagrass absorbs excess nutrients. Filamentous algae is held in check by two female model shore crabs that specialize in grazing, but clarity isn't the challenge here anymore. It's life cycling forward. I see fiddler crabs, shrimp, and porcelain crabs release larvae into the water. At night, I can watch the zoa drifting into the column, even see them growing, but none of them have ever made it to adulthood. Somewhere in this web, something holds them back. Maybe it's the larva being filtered out by the very organisms that keep the water so clean. Maybe the water is too clean, leaving nothing for them to feed on. Or maybe the right conditions for settlement simply aren't there. Whatever the reason, each new generation fails and the realm remains locked in place. Even among the snails, balance is pretty elusive. Populations of Sarah snails and lightning neurites have been in steady decline over a year. Not because of food shortages or breeding failures, but because of predation. The common Atlantic marginella has become one of the only truly successful multi-generational snails here, along with slipper snails. And I believe that's because marginellas are active hunters, chasing down the freshly hatched juveniles of other snail species and consuming them before they can establish. It's a dynamic that threatens diversity here and reduces the grazing pressure needed to keep surfaces clear of algae. So now I'm left with the decision. Do I introduce mud crabs, even though experience tells me that probably they won't be effective? Do I add larger predatory snails like the Florida crown conch, knowing it could wipe out clams and slipper snails along with the marginellas? Or do I cheat a little and manually remove the predators I find in order to give this realm a chance to evolve into a more balanced direction? Whatever direction we go with, the balance here can't remain as it is forever, so something definitely here has to change. So that's where we are today, a system that has found stability but risks stagnation. And that's not where the story ends, because if there's one lesson I've learned from building Minibyta, it's that resilience doesn't come from stillness, it comes from complexity. The more corrections, redundancies, overlapping roles, and habitat, the stronger the system becomes. That's why as this project moves forward, I'll keep adding life piece by piece. Some will thrive, some will fail, some will dominate, but each will push this system towards greater resilience, toward a complexity that mirrors the strength of Earth's ecosystems. So balance here isn't about keeping everything the same. Balance is alive, and the only way forward is to let it keep evolving.